Okay, I hope this works for you at least. All right, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all uh, this evening. And I'm here to talk about uh, startups and how startups need to scale and how they manage to do this, all right? So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Emiliano Spinella. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm a fake Italian, as we were <laughs> discussing. <laughs> um, I'm a computer engineer. And uh, last year, I co-founded a startup uh, here in Valencia. Uh, and we started in Demium, and now we are in Lanzadera. Uh, another Previously, I have been working as a product manager in software and telecommunications companies. And I'm a big fan of Linux. So uh, I mentioned that because most of the things you're going to see about the Sindeno platform are inspired on, on that uh, fanatism, all right? So first, I'd like to think up on what do we mean uh, when we talk about startups, all right? So there's a big difference between startups and the rest of the companies out there because the startups need to scale. And most of the startups currently follow a methodology that it's called the Lean Startup methodology. So this is about finding a problem that it's not uh, necessarily uh, solved in the market and validating that problem, all right? Validating, you know, the best way to validate a problem is actually by selling something. There are many uh, startups that started um, validating their product without having any product, without having anything, just by selling, hey, I have a solution for this, would you buy it? Maybe, you know, they only had a, a web page in which they say, hey, I have this solution, would you buy it? And people would enter their credit card information and only with that they would validate, hey, there's something here. So before building anything, you need to validate, all right? So once you have a given you know, grade of validation, you start building. And that's what we call the MVP, all right? We, you start building like a minimal viable product. And then once you have that minimal viable product, you have to validate that it actually you know, uh, works and, the, and people are using it and they are happy with it. You know? And once you validate that, you are in the best of the situations you know, because you have a product fit. It's like the market needs something, you build a solution, and that solution solves the issue, okay, you can sell. And the whole idea is to sell like this, you know, to have the costs, you know, like fixed, you know, and not necessarily growing at the same rate as your revenue. And that's uh, basically done by means of technology, all right? If you have a lot of manual work to do for every sale you make, you are going to have a cost that it's going to, you know, be linearly uh, growing with that revenue. But if you have a technology that allows you to sell a lot and keep that technology, keep that infrastructure, you are going to be able to scale. And basically we are talking about startups. So I mentioned technology. The technology is uh, the foundation of every startup. So here comes into play uh, the CTO, you know, because the CTO is the guy that somehow needs to uh, deal with all of the requirements to build the product, you know, and there is a tension in the life of a CTO in a startup. Basically, this tension is that you need to build the product, all right? Uh, you have to develop the minimum viable product, then you have to develop the version one, version two, and you have to iterate on that. But there, under the hood, hidden, there is another force here that it's, hey, the system obviously must be able to support the growth in users and in traffic, you know? So I mentioned obviously because in the mind of the CEO, in the mind of the commercial side of the startup, that's something, that's a given, you know? It's something, it's obvious that the system must support everything. But from the technical side, that is a requirement, you know? That is a non-functional requirement as we, you know, call it from the engineering side. And what, what force do you think wins this battle in the mind of the CTO at an early stage of a startup? If you had to choose, which one would you say? Yeah, definitely. Blue team, all right? That's the blue team. Uh, the, other, the other force is there, you know, it's hidden under the hood, and then there are some results. So the CTO has no time to think about architecture, all right? The CTO is going to, you know, do the minimum thing for the architecture and it's going to, you know, uh, continue with that. All the efforts are going to be focused on providing functionalities. They are going to be uh, prioritizing all the 
end user, you know, capabilities and functionalities. There is, no, there is not going to be any kind of automation. Or if there is some kind of automation, that's going to be very poor, all right? Uh, the system is not going to be tried or, you know, benchmarked for performance. So if it supports one user, okay, if it supports 20 users, perfect. But we don't actually know how many users at the same time it's going to be able to support. And finally, the, um, the cloud infrastructure is not going to be something very well thought. You know, it's, some, it's going to be something that, okay, if the CTO has been working previously with uh, AWS, that's the cloud it's going to use, the same with Azure or Google or whatever, all right? So uh, basically, all these tensions result in, a, in the single and most popular architecture that you're going to see in startups today. And this is the architecture. It's pretty simple, right? We have two code bases. We have a front-end project and a back-end project. Uh, these projects are deployed in a given you know, cloud infrastructure. We are going to talk about that uh, in just a moment. So uh, these projects are deployed in an instance. So you have a front-end instance and a back-end instance. And then you have the user. The user is going to access to the front-end. It's going to download all the files from the front end, like all the JavaScript, the HTMLs, and so on. And then the web browser is going to connect through API to the backend. OK? This is the most simple thing. So let's see what technologies startups are actually choosing you know, for all of these components. So first, let's start with the front end. Uh, today, most startups are choosing React for the front end, whether it's only React or whether it's Next.js. Next um, then we have Angular. And finally, we have Vue. There are some other uh, startups that maybe they have more time in the market that are using PHP, but that's something that no new startup is going to choose PHP for a front end application, all right? And it's interesting because Angular had a lot of inertia, you know, inertia. I don't know, in English you say inertia, you know, it was really popular sometime. And, but nowadays it's like React is eating the scene, you know, whether it's just React or this uh, new framework that it's based on React. So backend. In backend we also have PHP here, especially for uh, startups that have been out there for longer time. And then we have the most popular is Node. Node is the most po popular, whether it's directly with JavaScript or developed in TypeScript, all right? Then we have a small percentage with Java, and we've seen this on really specialized um, startups that need to develop a really complex system. Okay, Java, it's like a justification because the object-oriented model, all the APIs that Java uh, makes available, it's good for them. And then we have Python, whether it's just Python or Django, for instance. And the ones that use Python are mainly those that need to uh, develop some kind of functionality for machine learning, all right? Uh, or data science, for instance. They use Pandas, they use Scikit-learn, TensorFlow, and so on. So you're not going to see a startup that it's specialized on, on data science or machine learning that it's using Java, actually. That's not it. But yes, you're going to see a lot of them using Python and, and maybe a combination of Node and Python in that case. So for the da database, most of them are using some form or of SQL, all right? Relation, relational databases. Then MongoDB is super popular as well. And uh, for the uh, SQL, you have MariaDB or MySQL uh, and PostgreSQL. And there is only like a group of five or six startups that I've seen using SQL Server on Linux. That it's really strange, you know? Like using a Microsoft database on a Linux operating system, uh, it works. I don't know <laughs> how, but it works. I've seen it working, so it's, it's amazing. And then there is another, you know, uh, option there that it's Firebase Firestore. And from my perspective, this is like one of the, the ones I, don't really like, you know, because it's, it's, you can only use that database there, you know. If you have uh, uh, your code developed for MySQL, you can deploy your MySQL instance wherever you want. You know, you can deploy it on Amazon, on Google, you can do whatever you want, on your laptop, whatever. But Firestore, only Firestore, you know, it's like your application is completely coupled with, with Firestore. 
And one of the things we've seen is that it's really difficult for these companies when they, once they've chosen Firebase to get out of it, you know? It's super difficult because all of their user uh, data, their user credentials are there. And actually you cannot export it, it's there, you know? So y the migration process is really painful. Actually, from the companies I've seen, uh, most of them want to get out of Firebase, but they actually can't, you know? It's uh, super difficult. So then we have the cloud infrastructure part of it. So, and this is the part that, that for me is most interesting because uh, you would say, okay, how can we deploy these applications? One option is to directly install these applications on an operating system in a virtual machine in the cloud, right? So I buy, for instance, an EC2 instance in Amazon. I get an Ubuntu. I log in to the Ubuntu by SSH and I start installing the, I do a Git clone and I start in deploying that application, all right? So that, what I've just mentioned is the, uh, the thing that most startups are doing, like 46% of startups deal with the infrastructure like that. So you can see that it's, uh, it's strange because first of all, these applications are not dockerized, you know? They are not running in containers. The ones running in containers are the, one, uh, are the ones in the red color. It's 20% uh, in this study, at least. So that means that you have one operating system that is running three applications, including the database, right? Like one instance of, of an Ap Apache or Nginx, one instance of Node, and one instance of MariaDB, for instance, all installed in a single virtual machine. And that's a problem. We will see why. Then we have the other startups that are dockerizing their application. That's a little better, you know, uh, because you can move those containers to uh, other virtual machines without having to uh, think if they have any dependency with the operating system. And then we have the option of pass that it's like Heroku, you know, like Heroku or even um, this other option of uh, Google that it's App Engine, for instance. And finally, we, we have Kubernetes. All right, so Kubernetes is like, you see it really um, not too often, you know, Kubernetes is something difficult for a startup, but some of them are starting to, to, to get onto it. And then regarding the cloud providers, most of them are in Amazon Web Services. The 80% of them are in Amazon Web Services. Then we have 30% in Google. And this is mainly because of the strategy of these cloud providers. You know, Amazon provide, gives credits to startups for them to use for two years, I don't know a given amount of money. So that's, you know, a motivation for you to start using uh, those services. All right. So regardless of, of, of all these technologies that I have been discussing, like all the programming languages, the databases or the cloud providers, uh, there are some common pitfalls in these architectures. All right. And I'm going to talk about only two of those. The first one is backend applications they grow in functionalities, you know, and, and also in complexity. And this is basically driven by the iteration on the product. You know, you have to provide more functionalities continuously in order to achieve that product fit. But that in, uh, it has its counterpart in the architecture because it's going to cause some troubles. So we have this architecture, the one that we presented earlier. And now let's see this. It evolves, all right? So now I need to add more functionalities. I can do so by adding those functionalities in my backend instance, like my in, in that code base. But what usually startups do is they realize that they don't want to build like a monolithic application, a super big code base, and they start, you know, uh, decoupling those applications. And they say, okay, let's build a new, in a new code base that it's going to deal with order management, for instance, all right? So they start, creating other kind of applications in the same backend, but they connect them through services, through a REST API, for instance, all right? What's the problem with this? At the beginning, there's no issue, all right? This is going to work perfectly. But then when you start having more functionalities and more applications, there are some troubles. First of all, all of these are synchronous calls, all right? So when the users, when the users in the web browser clicks on a functionality, that's going to trigger a REST API call to the backend. But the backend, in this case, it's going, it needs to contact other applications in the backend. But in the meantime, the user is waiting. 
you know, it's waiting on the on the web page. And if you have many uh, applications in your backend and you have many users, maybe you start having failures, you know, you start having errors and you will need to start uh, capturing those errors uh, in your backend, in implementing somehow uh, retry mechanisms, you know, for the user not to perceive that error. And that's, uh, that's not too easy, you know. And basically the problem, the bottom line is that this does not scale when you start adding more applications or you start having more users. So what solution did we provide uh, from Sindeno? Basically, we recommend Apache Kafka for this. And what is Apache Kafka? So Apache Kafka is a software that was originally developed by LinkedIn, LinkedIn and it was made open source around tw uh, 2011 and it was then adopted by the Apache Foundation, that it's a foundation that, you know, um, somehow helps open source projects to mature and to uh, apply the best practices of open source projects. And it's a software that basically allows you to have a distributed messaging broker, all right? So it's like an email server, but for applications, not for people, all right? It's uh, a, a software that allows, allows you to have high availability, you know, because you, have, you can have several nodes of Apache Kafka and they uh, enable you to have message topics, all right? Like PO boxes, imagine, L all right? So in this case, the applications, instead of connecting among themselves using services, they can send messages, all right? And this is not synchronous because they are not waiting. When you send a message, when you send a letter, you're not waiting for a reply. You just send it. It's not like when you are calling somebody on the phone that you are waiting for an, a reply. It's asynchronous, all right? So this is really interesting because first it decouples the, uh, the, the, the application that sends the message from the application that receives the message. And the only thing that they have to focus on is on the, on the content on th of the message. They, the applications do not know different methods of, a of API methods of other applications, all right? So uh, th this doesn't mean that asynchronous communication is for everything, you know? There are some use cases for which asynchronous communication is awesome, especially if you have a lot of traffic, a lot of users. The applications are decoupled. That's something good from the software development perspective because if you modify something, you don't have to modify all the, the, all the other applications that depend on that. You only modify the application that you want to evolve. Apache Kafka can deal with enormous quantities of messages. It has a throughput of 600 megabytes per second. That's a lot, you know, and the latency is really, really small. It's five milliseconds. So the, the, all the time that, you know, it's added to the communications inside the backend is really, uh, you know, you, you can even not consider it. Consider it. Uh, you, can, uh, you can extend the cluster of Apache Kafka by adding more nodes, but also there are some drawbacks, you know, it's not all super nice because it has a steep learning curve. It's not easy to, to adopt Kafka, you know. Uh, it, it's a complex ar architecture. It's not easy, especially to maintain it. Maybe you can deploy it and you will be able to play with it. But when you have it on production, dealing with a lot of messages, something breaks and imagine all your architecture depends on that. Everything is out of uh, offline, all right? And then it impacts development because all these applications need to know how to send a message to Kafka, how to consume a message from Kafka. So it's not seamless. It's not like I deploy a Kafka and magically it solves my uh, scalability needs. All right. So this was the first uh, case, the first problem. The other problem that we that we see is uh, that backend applications grow in workload. All right. So not only you have more users, you need, to inter you, you need to have them communicate more efficiently, but also you need to support your applications. Going back to the same architecture, we have the backend, the frontend, and the database. So at the stage zero, everything is all right. You know, you have everything, all these applications in one virtual machine, but suddenly one application starts consuming a lot of CPU, you know? and actually starts competing with the other applications. So what do, you, what do you do, you know? So the first solution to this is, okay, let's decouple, you know, let's put the applications in different virtual machines. And for the backend, we can deploy a bigger virtual machine. So that now it's in green because it has enough 
CPU power. Yes, this is going to work, but only once or twice, because eventually you are going to hit a limit, you know? And this is what it's called a uh, vertical scalability, you know? You start adding more capacity, you know, uh, so that your application works. But be aware, because these virtual machines, these big virtual machines are not cheap. You know, to have to maybe one virtual machine in Amazon with 96, 96 gigas of RAM and 12 CPUs costs, I don't know, five, six euros per hour, you know? So it's not cheap, you have to be careful, it's not that easy. So vertical scalability has limits. And when this limit is reached, there can be an availability problems, you know? There, there can be like problems in which the user perceives that the system is not working. So what's the solution for this? I need to be able to scale horizontally, scale in a different way, and I will tell you how. So how do we do this in Sindeno? First, this layer that you see there, it says Kubernetes control panel, all right? We deploy Kubernetes for these kind of issues. So Kubernetes is a cluster in which you can have several nodes, all right? Several virtual machines, they can be of different size sizes, you know? You can have one virtual machine with a given quantity of RAM and another virtual machine with other capabilities, all right? But all of those resources are going to be aggregated and made available for the applications that want to run in the cluster. So then when I have these nodes, I am able to create a namespace. And inside this Kubernetes na namespace, I can start creating resources, all right? So the first resource I may want to create is uh, an ingress, you know? That's uh, the Kubernetes name for a proxy or a gateway in which I have a gateway for the front end and a gateway for, for the back end. Imagine in the front end I can have mycompany.com and in the back end I can have api.mycompany.com, okay? So here comes the magic of Kubernetes. I can have several instances of my application, both for the front end and the back end. So, and why is this useful? Basically because I can scale. I can deploy more instances of my application and if eventually I reach the limit of the uh, compute resources that these nodes are giving me, I can also scale those nodes. I can add, there are Kubernetes clusters with up to a uh, hundred uh, nodes. So uh, on that column of Kubernetes worker nodes, you can add a lot of them. So every time you add one node, you are going to have more resources. And the good thing about this is that you can automate, actually, this scaling, you know? So you can say, hey, if I have, on average, 20 users on, each, on the backend application, on average, 20 users, I want to deploy a new pod. I want to deploy a new instance of this application. So from the scalability perspective, this is awesome. If it works, it's awesome, you know? Because you don't have to care about you know, uh, deploying extra, uh, extra resources, uh, it's going to be elastic, it's going to grow, it's going to be diminished, and so on. So, uh, s some uh, bottom line. Uh, you can run multiple instances of these applications in a Kubernetes cluster. It's possible to automate the scaling. It's called in Kubernetes horizontal pod scaler. Um, it, Kubernetes also includes a lot of resources. I've just mentioned a couple of them, like ingress, service, and pod. There are many more, many more. Uh, you can even deal with uh, TLS certificates and so on. Um, DNS, wow, it's uh, endless, the, li the list. And it also includes this uh, load balancer, this internal load balancer that it's going to, you know, distribute traffic among the different replicas of your application. Um, what I mentioned also, you can grow in number of nodes, but again, there are some drawbacks, you know? You, this is not easy. It's super complex. I, w I would dare say that it's, it, it's more complex than uh, Kafka, you know? Kafka, at least you know that it's, it does one thing. This does a lot of things, you know? And there are a lot of, you know, extensions, um, like beta APIs, there are, poof, a lot, and it's growing really fast. Imagine this project started in uh, 2015, and today is the second biggest project in the open source community. You know which is the first uh, open source project that most contributor has? The Linux kernel. Exactly, so it's huge, you know, it's growing really fast, all right? 
And another drawback is that you cannot deal with Kubernetes without DevOps, without automated DevOps. You need to have automation. It's not something that you can, you know, log in SSH to the server and maintain it. It's impossible. It's, uh, you know, you are going to fail if you uh, tackle Kubernetes like that. You need a Jenkins or a GitLab. You need something, some tool like that that can help you, you know, to automate some of the tasks. If not, it's, it's terrible. So uh, what do we do at Sindeno? Well, basically, we provide Kubernetes and Kafka and many other tools. What we've done is uh, we uh, design an architecture. Since the CTO doesn't have time to do that, you know, because they need to provide functionalities, we say, OK, we provide uh, uh, an architecture that is co cohesive, you know, and you will be able to run on top of this architecture most of the things you want, except you want to do, I don't know, machine learning in, uh, in the moon, you know? In that case, maybe it's not the best platform, but uh, for most of the applications that a startup need, this architecture is going to be, it's going to work. And what do we have here? Well, basically, in the bottom of this diagram, we can see that we have the different cloud providers. So you can deploy this platform in any cloud provider. Tha and that's something good, because if today you have your workload in Amazon, but tomorrow you want to go to, to Google, it's going to be easier, it's not going to be magic, but it's going to be easier than if you are using AWS Lambda functions, for instance, all right? So we are multi-cloud. On top of these cloud providers, we deploy Kubernetes, and on top of Kubernetes, we can deploy whatever the startup needs. Usually, what they need is the typical architecture, a front-end uh, application, a back-end application, and a database. We also provide Kafka, we provide some uh, functionalities for machine learning, um, Kafka, uh, it's really awesome to, to gather real-time metrics. You know, you can gather a lot of information and you can expose it with a Grafana instance, for, for example. And we also provide the Jenkins en en engine for all the uh, automation. And currently, we are working on some APIs on the platform side because what we are seeing now is that many startups need to develop functionalities really common, you know, create user, create account, uh, create subscription, why are you why do all startups code that you know i mean it's something that it's part of your critical path but <coughs> you at the beginning if you want to be fast maybe you can use some apis and some platform that provides that to you you know with an open source mentality also so that's uh, something that we are working now so as a conclusion uh sindeno platform eases you know the way to adopt these technologies because you, it's not that you have to do all the courses in Udemy to understand Kafka and Kubernetes because we can help you on that. Um, we have a standard architecture based on Kubernetes. All the components here are open source. You can run it wherever you want. And that's something that I mentioned at the beginning that I'm a big Linux fan. I'm a big open source, you know, uh, guy. So all the components here are open source. You can run it uh, even on your laptop. Uh, it, it includes uh, Jenkins for automation, it's multi-cloud, and it provides a broad range uh, of tools for applications. So that's my talk. I hope you liked it. And now, if you have any question. <laughs> any questions, somebody? OK. Yeah. And then my application would talk to you and you would talk to the cloud or, or how do you actually do that? Your application is deployed on top of this Kubernetes that that Kubernetes is our platform. It's like a, a Kubernetes, you know, a customized Kubernetes. That's what we want to like in these two layers. What we want to convey is that, you know, it's like it's our platform that is based on Kubernetes. So your application runs on top of it. So my, my, let's say my Docker images will be deployed in, in, in exactly. It's going to be deployed on a Kubernetes cluster on your Amazon account because it's going to be your account. You know, yeah. if you have your Amazon account, you are going to give us the uh, credentials access and we will deploy a lot of resources on your account. So you will have a Kubernetes that is going to be yours and your application is going to be running on top of that. So in practice, I talk to Sindeno, I don't talk to the cloud provider. I don't talk to Kubernetes. Uh, you can talk to Kubernetes if you want. I mean, your application uh, usually does not need to connect with the cloud provider. You know, it usually connects with the users externally. You know, 
Uh, so in this case, it would be exactly the same. Eventually, if you want to leverage some of these functionalities that I mentioned, like create user, create account, and so on, you would connect with Sindeno, but only in that case. So what is the difference between a talk to Kubernetes in, in, a, in Amazon directly and, and have you? Kubernetes does not provide you with uh, APIs for creating user, creating account, managing credentials, and so on. And the other thing is that if you want to do that, you can do it. Actually, anybody can you know, deploy uh, Kubernetes in Amazon or in Google, but you will have to learn it for yourself. And the thing here is that startups, you know, they don't have time to do that. They don't have time to you know, understand how this technology works, to go through this learning curve in order to deploy an application that is going to be on production. You know? That's the, the trade-off, all right? Yeah. Of Kafka, yeah, exactly. I w we mentioned Kafka because it's like the main use case we have, but we also have the option of RabbitMQ and Mosquito Server for MQTT. Yeah. That's another option. Under the yeah, example. exactly. As long as they are open source, we can deploy it. Mm -hmm. you know? I think it's more lightweight. Yeah. yeah, you know, the, uh, the way in which we decide whether to offer Kafka or RabbitMQ, uh, definitely MQTT Server is something for IoT. We are not going to consider MQTT server for, you know, a soft an application that doesn't have any kind of interaction with IoT devices. But the the way in which we choose between RabbitMQ and Apache Kafka is, if you are going to have a a continuous stream of messages, mm -hmm. Kafka is your choice. If you are going to have discrete messaging, like uh, one message per minute, you know, like really seldomly, uh, RabbitMQ may be better for you. It depends on the use case, exactly, yeah. Yes, Sorry. Um, when I would say, okay, let's, let's, let's bring this stuff together and we get uh, our applications, our Docker widgets and so on, you say to me, I'm using a lot of open source. Yeah. Um, how is it about the licenses? Can I sell my product then with uh, all the open source? Which open source license do you use? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, open source basically has the Apache license, uh, the MIT license and the GPL license. You know, all of these licenses allow you to make a copy of the software and use it without any guarantee. You know, so none of the open source licenses are going to prohibit you from using that software anywhere you want or copying that software. So you don't have to pay license for open source. You know. So I'm, it's not allowed to share your software? When, when I have um, open source software, which is GPI2 or Apache 2, I guess, um, then it's not allowed to, to use it in another infrastructure by a customer or something like this. I am only allowed to use it by myself, but not to share it. But, I mean, if you have your own application that uses, for instance, a MySQL database, a MySQL from MariaDB, that's an open source project, you know? So you can deploy that software wherever you want, uh, and it's not that your application just for being for using MariaDB you cannot publish that application as open source. Actually, most of the open source projects use a backend database. For instance, Keycloak, that it's a Red Hat uh, project. It uses a PostgreSQL database, and it's a but they do not provide the PostgreSQL. You know, they say, hey, if you want to use this open source project, you have to deploy a database you know but it's it's allowed i mean maybe i'm not understanding correctly but um but you can you know publish your op your open source application that's that uses other open source tools right is that what you are asking me well um, maybe i'm mixing up maybe i come later back to you okay uh, awesome yeah. great Yeah, I mean, if you want to get the benefits of scalability, imagine only, let's talk about uh, Kubernetes because Kafka, it's another, you know, it's different. But uh, in that case, you have two options, or you learn Kubernetes by yourself 
and try to deploy the applications or you give us an access to your repository, uh, some credentials for a cloud provider and for instance uh, a docker file, you know, how you build your application. We also do that for our customers in case they don't have it. Only with that information we can deploy your application uh, in, the, in, the, in the cloud. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, what what we provide is a, a group of APIs through which you can access your service to do, you know, basic stuff. For instance, know which services you have uh, purchased, how much you are paying for them, and do some basic operations like, for instance, getting uh, how uh, how many nodes you have in your Kubernetes, or if you want to add one node to your Kubernetes, and the web panel that we currently have uh, is more focused on these common functionalities that I mentioned. If you want, for instance, instead of developing all the functionalities to create a user, to create a subscription, a product, and so on, you can use this control panel. But uh, currently, what we are working on is to have an operator for the platform, you know, like some uh, tool that allows you to create resources directly on, on, the, on top of the Kubernetes. You understand? Yeah? Okay, awesome. Cool, thanks. Uh, great presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm also a Linux user. Yeah. Um, I'm not full time, a little bit worse. Yeah. But sometimes <laughs> yeah. there are problems. Yeah. Um, yeah, for those situations, what kind of observability or monitoring solutions yeah. do you provide? Yeah, so when we install uh, the platform, it includes a Prometheus operator. So Prometheus is another open source project that was created in Sun SoundCloud and uh, that it's super powerful because it discovers everything that's installed in the Q Kubernetes service. So we use that for internal monitoring, you know, so every platform that we deploy has the, the Prometheus operator through which we extract a lot of information of the cluster. And that's part of our internal monitoring. So if something happens, we will tell you, hey, there is a problem with one application or we will take action. In case you want to see all of that information, you have to include in your, uh, in your, I mean in your instance, a Grafana instance. Because Grafana can connect with uh, Prometheus and expose all that information for the cluster for you, of the cluster for you, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, how uh, those applications are, let's say, uh, uh, I as your client, should I uh, provide, uh, deploy them uh, on the cluster, or uh, uh, you uh, have uh, something to deploy those? We things? do it. Yeah, we and do it. And then uh, how you deal with uh, backups and? Uh, well, that's a super interesting question. We have a couple of methods for backups, but the one that we like the most is a Kubernetes has another resource that it's called cron job. So you can create a cron job and it's going to execute a pod. In that pod, you can put a connection to the database, extract all the database and put it in a bucket, an S3 bucket in Amazon, for instance, or in cloud storage in Google. So it's a backup, but it's, a, it's basically a, a database dump that you store uh, as an object in one of these services. So you build uh, some type of job to exactly, yeah, a cron job. Yeah. Awesome. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.